Steve, je, je sais que vous comprenez le français, donc je vais me permettre de vous présenter euh, euh, en français. Euh, donc vous êtes euh, sociologue au Department of Social Policy and Criminology euh, à l'Open University. Et, euh, et donc vous allez nous présenter un papier qui nous entraîne là, cette fois dans la construction toujours de, de l'islamophobie, mais plus du point de vue de, de sa conceptualisation, je, je crois. Donc nous vous écoutons. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm completely deaf. You can do better than this. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay, that's a little bit better. That'll have to do. Okay, ten papers gone, two left. We can do this. Right. Right, what I'm going to do is talk about a project that I've been doing with an American scholar called Sahir Selod, who's based at Simmons College in Boston. And the mic, the mic is too low. Yeah. Yeah. Right. to start again? Okay, I'm going to talk to you about a project that I've been doing with an American scholar called Sahir Selod, who is um, at Simmons College in Boston. Um, we are scholars of uh, race, and we met at the American Sociological Association in 2010 in Atlanta. And we started discussing our work, and we decided to do a project on looking at Islamophobia through the lens of racialization. We're both race scholars. We use racialization as a key concept. Um, I'm more of a, a scholar of racism, racisms, plural, and Sahir's PhD is on um, middle class American Muslims' experiences of Islamophobia. Okay? So, we're both having a similar problem. The problem was of um, trying to understand, read, and talk about Islamophobia as a form of racism. For Sahir, it was more the academic world where she found that it was very rigidly compartmentalized into religious discrimination and racial discrimination, with all the history of the development of <coughs> racial discrimination in the USA behind this. So she was having difficulty talking about Muslims as the subject of racialization. For me, it was more people outside academia, people that I have to talk to a lot for my work. I'm a qualitative interviewer. I do lots of um, empirical field work with what I call normal people. People who aren't academics. Imagine, imagine the amount of work I have to do like that. And the other thing is that I talk quite often to people who make policy, which is another cup of tea altogether. But the same problem occurs. How do we understand uh, Islamophobia as a form of racism? There's a resistance to understanding Islamophobia as a form of racism. It's either religion or culture, but it's not race. So both of us are told in different ways, repeatedly, that our framework for understanding our topic is not the correct one. So the project is to um, have a special issue of a journal, Critical Sociology, which is actually coming out in February or March, and all of the articles are empirical fieldwork, ethnographies, qualitative interviews, etc., about the racialization of Muslims. Mm. Okay. So that's my little group done. So, I'm going to go through this slide very quickly. This was our thinking at the beginning of this project. If you look on, for example, Google Scholar, and you track the number of um, articles containing the word Islamophobia, you have a graph which is like this. 1989-90, it's there, and it takes off around 2000 and heads upwards. 2010, it reaches a peak, and then it's slowly dropping off now. So at the peak, there were more than 3,000 articles with the word Islamophobia somewhere in the article. Okay, so that's a lot of scholarship. This is a big corpus now. And what we noted, the key types of things which recur <coughs> in scholarship are the roles of the state, the roles of non-state actors, civil society, and the intersection of Islamophobia and nationalist political movements, okay? big areas. Also, we note that the um, type of work is primarily critical analysis of secondary sources, like the second panel today, which is really interesting. Okay, so that, that was our um, thinking. And there was a, a much less important part of this work, which was ethnographies, qualitative interviewing projects. Okay, so that said to us, there is a space where we can do our project. Consensus on Islamophobia, clearly, in American academia, no, outside of academia, in Britain, it's much more difficult to talk about Islamophobia as a form of racism. And so we're thinking about how to, how to argue a 
about bodies, cultures, and religions, and try to make this into something which is coherent. So we were hoping for a set of fieldwork projects which made the links between the body, the culture, and religion clearer or more complicated, or both at the same time, which is what I'm going to present to you. <laughs> I'm a sociologist. <laughs> so I'm going to present the, the two logics. This is a real basic starting point. And I'm presenting two logics because I did my postgraduate work in France. And as you well <coughs> know, you must present your essays as thèse, argument, antithèse, counter argument, synthèse, <laughs> synthesis. <laughs> Although in my case, it's more often thèse, antithèse, L. <laughs> you don't need a translation. And I'm sure there are lots of people in this room who suffer the same thing. Anyway, so our two logics were, first logic which um, Sahir comes up against frequently. Starting point is, religion isn't about naturalized distinctions. It's about body. So you have body on one side, you have religion on the other side. Okay, so there's a clear line between them. Therefore, when you look at faith groups, for example, Islam, the people who are Muslims come from lots of different groups. So therefore, how can a discrimination against a religious group be about race? Right? So that's conclusion. You can't read religious affiliation off the body. In other words, you can't look at racial discrimination and religious discrimination in the same way using the same tools. This is the problem that Sahir comes across in the American context. You could also, for the British context, take the word religion out and put in something like culture. Everything is about culture, nothing is about body. So people are discriminated against through cultural forms, clothes, um, buildings, ideas, but not the body, because people from all kinds of different backgrounds are Muslims. Okay? So, for example, typical um, far-right propaganda, which we see all the way across Europe, often contains a picture of a mosque with a red circle and a line through it. Or something like this, lots of women wearing veils or at least headscarves <coughs> and some kind of slogan. Anybody read Danish? Yeah. It, it, it means, it's the Danish equivalent of when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Okay, and it's trying to say that Muslim women do not integrate into Danish society. Again, another very common trope and visual image which is used the far right movements across Europe. So, our logic, this is the antithèse, okay? Race has always been about both culture and the body. This is what my understanding of race is. Um, I think that, that the focus on the body, which we see in the 19th century and the end of the 18th century is really the unusual bit. Before this, it's primarily about culture, and now, what people call the new racism, or neo-racism, is again a return to using culture as a, a dominant way of talking about race. So for me, the two things are always linked in the same set of practices, which means you can attach racialized understandings to a body or to a culture or both at the same time. I think if you look at just those two images, you can see that these are about homogenizing, racializing groups of people using different varieties of cultural, physical, and other types of information. So, conclusion, for us, for me and Sahir, um, religious affiliation is racialized. <coughs> now, there's lots of discussion you could have about this. This could be the entire presentation. I could stop now, and we could have a discussion. But I'm not going to. <laughs> so I want to go into this a bit more. So, for us then, the idea of race, whatever is in those giving, is to do with lots of different things and not just bodies. So for us then, the idea of racialization is a, a process. So if you say a process, there has to be a historical beginning, something you can trace up to the present day, right? There has to be some historical scope in it. And so what we're looking at is how race becomes a salient feature of social relationships. And these social relationships in racialization are always unequal power relationships as well. People don't meet each other on common cultural ground. And so when we, when we thought about um, the experiences of Muslims in the States and in Europe, um, our thinking was that you can make race out of lots of different things and stick them together. And the idea of stickiness 
is something that came out of our discussions. <coughs> Clothes, attachment to land, religion, language, lots of different ways that you can um, create and construct identities and then impose them on <coughs> people. Also, people who are nominally white in these societies and therefore occupy a certain number of privileged positions can be made less white. This is true in lots of different ways. I will not bore you today with all of the things I think about this because they're already published elsewhere. If you want to be bored by them, you can go and look them up. But the important thing is that for us, racialization is not just to do with different racialized groups in the kind of 19th century sense. It's to do with the whole spectrum of people who are made into a racialized group according to combinations of color, religion, nationality, lifestyle, etc. So there's always a hierarchy as a result of this. Okay, so key thing, other factors can be read onto the body. The body is how race becomes materialized, but lots of other factors get read onto the body. So for us then, uh, we decided that for us the story we're trying to tell is about reading culture onto the body. So for example, late 18th century, 19th century, people would read bodies and say this body demonstrates that there is a, this level of culture, you know, the classic um, Linnaeus or some of the um, 19th century philosophers who wrote about race say this very starkly. These bodies represent a certain level of civilization and this is why. Okay? For us it's now almost the other way around. You can take a body which is in a neutral space and read culture onto it. I'm going to show you what I mean. That's just a filler thing. It's got a, another picture of it. The um, Boston Bombers, the Sino Brothers. If I can get this bigger so you can see it properly. Right, so if you look at that um, cover, which is um, next to the these photographs of those men. If I can get rid of this one, that so would help. So you can actually see what I'm trying to talk about. <laughs> okay. So, what we have is two men from the Caucasus, which is obviously where the word Caucasian comes from. So it's the real heartland of white supremacy. And then you've got these pictures of the men here, the actual photographs of what they look like in real life. And then you have the cartoon versions of them over here, in which they're, they're, they're not white anymore, right? There's all kinds of ideas about who these people are that makes, that makes them not white. So if you're interested in this process, and for example, you look at pictures of Irish people in American representations of the, in the 19th century, this is very similar to that. Especially, I suppose you could also make the link about um, the Irish being turned into terrorist um, suspects in the British journals of the 19th century where they, their faces were typically darker than the white figures around them, etc. And, and they were made to look aggressive and evil, etc. So this is my um, suggestion for the ways that we think about reading culture onto a body, right? The body's been transformed by the cultural context that we look through. Right, so I'm going to give you some very brief um, examples of what we were talking about in this, this project. The first one is from Sahih's article about um, middle class um, American Muslims and their experiences of uh, being racialized in post 9 11 America. And what the first thing we note is that in each of the countries that we're talking about, thinking about, and we're working in, there's a different idea of who a Muslim is, right? Typically in Britain, who a Muslim is, is someone who has a South Asian background. In France, someone from a North African background maybe, or in America, someone from the Middle East, right? So national um, and regional issues also are important in this. And so what Sahib found was that, first of all, there's an absolute conflation of Arab and Muslim. In this way of thinking, all Arabs are Muslim, all Muslims are Arab, and this is one way to identify people and locate them culturally throughout. 
second thing is the, the wide variety of combinations of ways that people are identified using clothing, skin color, <coughs> facial hair, etc. The men, and she found that there's like a spectrum of possibilities in her sample with women with darker complexions who wear headscarves at one end, and men who have uh, lighter complexions and shave at the other end. And this spectrum corresponds to a capacity to make yourself invisible or pass for white or whichever way you want to talk about it. And she talks about the people uh, deploying strategies for avoiding unwelcome attention by representing themselves in different ways. Okay? So one example of how this works, one of her um, sample was a man who passed for white at work, tried to avoid ever talking about any subject that would reveal him as a Muslim. And he had managed to do this successfully. When he goes out in public with his wife, who is a white convert to Islam, who wears a headscarf, then he regularly receives um, um, aggressive comments and he is called um, an Arab, go home Arab, etc. So it's not even his body that's changed, it's the body of the person that he's seen with in public. Okay? So it's almost like a vicarious racialization, is this one example. The frequency of microaggressions leads us to believe that these are almost endemic to being a Muslim in America, and this is in a relatively privileged uh, professional setting, as most of these things happen at work or uh, at leisure spaces. Okay, so this is something to think about, um, microaggressions being something constantly that they have to manage and deal with and try to avoid. And the, the obvious thing that's true everywhere is that the headscarf is read as oppression. And this is one way that people are very readily identified and um, insulted. And it's used in all kinds of ways to, to say that you're not part of America, basically. This is Sahih's conclusion that they are de-Americanized by this process of racialization. Okay? And she calls it being excluded from the imaginary space of the nation by these constant jokes, constant um, aggressions, etc., about who you are and where you should go. So the, the headscarf example um, she has of a, of a woman who came to America um, from um, the Middle East and she didn't wear a headscarf when she came to America. She studied at a university, began to become more interested in Islam, <coughs> decided she wanted to wear the headscarf. And one day she's in a shopping mall and a woman comes over to her and puts her hand on her shoulder and says, it's okay, you're in America now, you don't have to wear this anymore. In a very sympathetic, <laughs> condescending way. And, uh, so you see what the, the thought processes are going on behind this. Okay. Right. The All American Muslim is a TV program. There's also an article in our special edition about that, so that's another plug. Right. <laughs> Written. Um, <coughs> I've put this question in here because otherwise I'll forget at the end. Because um, what we're trying to do all the same time is, w when you're doing qualitative and ethnographies, it's so interesting and absorbing that you often forget the bigger picture. And then you come to write your paper or your book or whatever you're doing, and there's no space to put the macro stuff in, and it's really difficult to think about. So all the time we're trying to put together the, the micro level experiences, we're trying to think how it fits into the macro ones as well. And that, that process is still going on. So if you can help with that, that would be great. Okay, so Britain. Um, two examples, there are plenty of other ones. When I did a, a large interview project with a colleague, Simon Clark, uh, a few years ago, we were interviewing people about national identity, social class, community, and integration was not one of our questions. However, people kept talking about integration themselves, and one of the themes which recurs is people talking about integration and they immediately give the example of what is not integration. And what is not integration is always Muslims. It's either particular types of clothes, um, not speaking English, um, attitudes towards women, or even more interesting, um, local authorities which ban Christmas this is a made-up story, an invented story, which never happens, but very many people believe it, like a myth. And the idea is that local authorities banned Christmas cards, banned Christmas decorations, banned Christmas plays in schools, because they did not want to offend Muslims. Okay, so 
in these different roles, you see Muslims as almost a framing device for all kinds of um, feelings about being abandoned and lost and bereavement. I think someone earlier on was talking about a feeling of loss. And this really comes out across all of our stories. And one of the ways in which it's expressed is talking about this group which, for these people, appears to be um, having unfair access to all kinds of resources and even to the point of controlling Christmas. One day I'll give a paper <coughs> about the crisis of Christmas. Uh, that'll be really interesting. So I'm sure people have got other stories about that. Okay. The last example I'll give you is uh, Leon Musavi's article, which is about white converts' experiences in England. And there are lots of really interesting things to say about Leon's um, article. But I'll just pick up two. White converts' experiences very often include being re-racialized as not white anymore. Okay, so you start off as white and normal in an all-white town, and when you put on your headscarf or your other clothes, or you have a beard, and you're with someone else who has a headscarf, for example, at this point, people start to racialize you in different ways and shout insults at you and say, are oh, you a terrorist? We're very familiar with the types of things that people say, right? So that in itself is not very interesting. But what is interesting, how you can go from one lo um, social location to another so quickly just by becoming a Muslim. Okay, so that's an interesting thing about how the body and culture and religion are linked inextric inextricably together, I think. Um, Leon's other um, experience is typically that people start, once they start to experience these types of um, racist situations, start to think ahead. How can I avoid this situation? Where should I not go? What clothes should I not wear? What time should I go, etc., etc. And Leon says at some point, these people are suffering from Islamophobia, phobia. Because mm. they start to organize their time around what, what would happen if. Okay, so they become absorbed into the idea of how to manage Islamophobia. And they start to change their behavior based on things that might happen or might not happen. Right? There's plenty of other things that Leon finds, but I thought those are particularly interesting things. So, I haven't got a conclusion because I knew we were really short of time, so I'll just leave it there, and I'm sure you can think of your own conclusions. <laughs>